Our journey together uh, has taken us to the eighth book of the Bible, which is the book of Ruth, if you'll locate that. Um, easiest way to find it is the table of contents in the front of your Bible. Ruth, again, the eighth book of the Bible. It's the third book in this historical section of the Old Testament that started with Joshua and will take us all the way through Esther. And uh, Ruth is one of only two books in the Bible that bear the name of a woman, Ruth and Esther. And it's, it's interesting to sort of contrast the two. Ruth is a Gentile woman living in Israel and Esther is, an, is a Hebrew woman living in a Gentile world and both of them having an extreme effect upon their world as they simply obey the Lord. Um, the book gets its name from its main character and that is Ruth and the book consists of four short chapters, uh, 85 total verses. I didn't do a word count. You can do that on your own. It's clear that the book of Ruth is, was written uh, during the early reign of David as the king. Uh, tradition says that it was written by Samuel the prophet. And we know that it was written in the early time of David's reign because the closing verse of the chapter makes reference to the genealogy of Ruth, her descendants, all the way to David and no mention of anyone past that. And so uh, this written during the time of David. Um, in many ways, the book of Ruth serves as kind of a, a, an appendix to the book of Judges. Um, in, we'll see in just a moment, it was written during that time. And as we studied last time, the, the, the time period of the Judges, this 300 plus years that, that the, the book of Judges covered was a very, very dark time in the nation of Israel. Um, and particularly because people were doing whatever was right in their own eyes. They were ignoring the word of God and they were doing whatever they wanted to do. And in the midst of that, we have the book of Ruth telling this beautiful story of redemption. In fact, uh, the, word, uh, the, the word redeemed, I think, is, is used seven times, or redemption, seven times in the New King James Version. But the word translated redeemed um, is also translated near kinsmen, and it's used 22 times in the 85 verses. And so redemption is, a, is one of the key messages within the book of Ruth. And redemption is the idea of purchasing back, but it's also the idea of, of restoring what has been destroyed. Someone who had been redeemed, not only were they bought out of what they were in, but they were restored. The beauty of life was restored unto them. And we're gonna see a great picture of that in the book of Ruth. Now, um, it's kind of been our approach here as we're looking at these books of the Bible to talk a little bit about why it's important to study them. And so I wanna give you a couple of reasons why it's important to study the book of Ruth. First of all, the, a, a good understanding of Ruth will stem out of understanding its historical setting. In other words, where Ruth is found. Um, Ruth is not a book sitting isolated to no other part of history. Uh, we read in verse 1 of chapter 1 that it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. And we know um, from the closing chapters of the book of Judges that the condition of the world or of Israel at the time of the judges ruling was a, a very, very dark time. Uh, that there was a sort of an existential worldview stemming again out of this idea of we don't have to listen to God, we don't have to do what his word says, everyone can decide for themselves what is right and everyone can do what is right in their own eyes. And that kind of living we saw led to spiritual confusion, moral decay and social disorder. The nation was an absolute mess. And uh, today, we kind of live in that same era. We talked about those parallels last time. It really struck me continuing to think about that. I, I thought about what might be a slogan for our world today. And if we had, a, if we had an ad campaign for 
for the, you know, the, the 21st century in, in the world today, or at least in the Western world. And that slogan might be, everyone's doing it. You know, everyone's doing it. And we determine what is morally acceptable based upon what everyone's doing. In fact, we live in a country where morality is determined by popular vote. And that's scary. <laughs> everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. And so there are these great parallels between the time in which Ruth lived and the time in which we live. And Ruth is, is like a beacon of light in the, in the midst of that, of that chaos that the world was living in as a result of this existentialism. Um, Ruth is gonna tell a different story from what is going on in Judges. In that darkness, spiritual confusion, moral depravity, social chaos and disorder, the book of Ruth is gonna tell a different story. It's gonna give us insight into what will happen with an individual who in the midst of that world will choose to commit themselves to the Lord and follow his ways. And Ruth is that story. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And it's a story of obedience to the word of God in the midst of a dark world and the fruit that comes out of that. Um, we see two, well, three primary things I wanna touch on kind of in our introduction. Number one is that this this choice uh, or this book of Ruth illustrates for us um, what happens in the life of a person who will commit themselves to the Lord. And this, the book of Ruth is really just the following the story of a family. It, it, the early chapter of the, uh, or the first chapter of the book talks about the difficulty that they face, talk about the hardship that they faced, and, and the rest of the book talks about God's redeeming grace and blessing this family and caring for them. And so it's a real picture of God caring for an individual family out of all the families in the world. Secondly, it's also a picture of God fulfilling his ultimate purpose. If you were here with us in our very first study, we, we did kind of a brief overview of the whole Bible. And we talked about the, a central theme that's in the Bible, and that central theme is salvation. God has an ultimate plan. The Bible's ultimate purpose is not to tell us about Ruth and Boaz. The Bible's ultimate purpose is not to tell us about the work of creation. The Bible's ultimate purpose is not to talk to us about a tabernacle. The, the Bible's ultimate purpose is to show man, sinful man, how he can be in a relationship with God. And that, and that God, in order to bring that about, brought his son into the world, and that his son went to the cross, and that his son rose from the dead. And so there, the, the Bible has a central purpose, and that central purpose is salvation. And the book of Ruth really plays an important role in the ultimate purpose of God. In fact, it, 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 Ruth plays a pivotal role in Scripture. Ruth is going to connect a, the period of time where the nation of Israel was ruled by these judges, these, these uh, individual rulers. It's, gonna, it's, it's the transition to the nation being ruled by a kingdom, a monarchy. And um, it's in the book of Ruth that we will be introduced to David. Ruth is the great, great grandma of David. And so here this woman, in the midst of this depravity, choosing to follow the Lord, choosing to be committed to the Lord, and ultimately the Lord will use her to bring David into the world. And the purpose of bringing David in the world ultimately is not just so he'd be a good king over the nation and give them a period of years where they would have success, but David was brought into the world because David's descendant ultimately would be Jesus himself. And so Ruth fits into the, 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 this genealogy of Christ. Ruth brings Jesus to the world. And so what an incredible picture. Um, Alexander McLaren said this. He said that the blackest times were not so dismal in reality as they look in history. The blackest times are not as dismal in reality as they look in history. What he was pointing out is that God has a plan. And the book of Ruth is gonna reveal that in the midst of that darkness, God has a plan. And it's also gonna reveal 
that, a, the, that an individual, a godly individual, will play an important role in the ultimate plan of God. One more thing that Ruth illustrates. Not only does it illustrate God's care for an individual family, not only does it illustrate the big picture of God bringing his son into the world, but the book of Ruth also illustrates for us, the, the, gives us these values into the, the purpose of a godly marriage. And Ruth is a beautiful picture of that. Um, Ruth is really a love story. It's the love story uh, of its main character, Ruth, and this man that we'll be introduced to in the second chapter named Boaz. And they will uh, fall in love with each other. And they become an example to the unmarried. You see, in the midst of a, a, a perverse world, a very dark world, Ruth and Boaz remained pure before their marriage. And they're an example of that. Secondly, they're an example of this young couple being brought together by the Lord. As Ruth was doing what God wanted her to do, following the word of God, and as Boaz was doing what God wanted him to do, following the word of God, God brought them together. And then thirdly, they're a picture of the purpose of marriage. Take a look with me at verse 9 of chapter 1. This is, uh, we're jumping ahead a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about the context of this in a second. But uh, Naomi says this. She says, the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. You kissed them and lifted up their voice and wept. Let me read that again. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. And this is a beautiful picture of, of God's purpose in a marriage. It's a, it, that the, the, this relationship where the wife comes under the husband and it's this beautiful picture of joint unity and love for one another. That's God's design for a marriage. Um, uh, J. Sidlow Bas Baxter points out this tradition. He says that in the ancient world, the groom, hear a ringing, the groom would cast his garment over his bride to show the protection that he offered her. So part of the ceremony is he would, he would take this, this uh, sorry, this garment, the shawl, and he would lay it over the top of his bride. And that would be a picture of the fact that I'm now a covering for you and that there's rest and security and safety and love in the relationship that we have. And uh, in, uh, later we're gonna see that, that Naomi is gonna take her shelter in the Lord. And it's the same idea that just as she would find rest in her husband, she would find shelter in the Lord, and that really the marriage relationship is to be this relationship of mutual love and pouring into one another. And so there's a beautiful picture of that in this book of Ruth. Now, in terms of an outline, your Bible outlines the book of Ruth very well. Four chapters. And the four chapters divides the book up perfectly into four scenes. And so we're just gonna walk through those scenes together. The book is short enough that we'll be able to walk through all of it together. Uh, the first uh, five verses of chapter one kind of set the scene. Let's read them together. I'll read to you, you follow along. We read, it came to pass in the days that the judges ruled that there was famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi, the names of the two sons, Malon, Chilion. They were uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab, the name of one was Orpha, the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died, so the women survived her two sons and uh, her husband. And so uh, right away we're introduced as the scene sets that there was famine in the land and that Elimelech took his family to Moab. Now, Samuel, or whoever wrote this book, um, he, he doesn't here identify the fact that there was any sort of 
you know, the cause behind this or, or sinful cause behind any of this. But if we look elsewhere in scripture, we realize that the famine here was really a byproduct of sin. That this famine was not just a natural disaster. If you notice the screen, uh, Leviticus 26 verse 3 reads this. God speaking to his nation, he says, if you walk in my statutes and you keep my commandments and perform them, next verse reads, then I will give you rain in its season and the land shall yield its produce and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Okay, I mean, God's making a promise. It's pretty simple. If you do what I say, you follow me, you follow my word, then here's what I'm gonna do. It's gonna rain in Israel. And when it rains, you're gonna end up having crops and you're not gonna be in famine. In Egypt, Israel lived off of the Nile River. The, 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 the way in which they survive is off of the Nile. Israel's not the same way. Israel was dependent upon continual annual rainfall. And God says, I'm making you a promise. If you are obedient to me, I will control the weather and it will rain and you'll be successful. Now, that's not a promise to the church. God doesn't promise that to you and me. We can't say, oh, God's promised for it to rain. And then if you're going, but I was going to have a picnic. I don't want it to rain. Okay, this is a promise to the nation of Israel and God's provision. Okay, now in the same chapter, Leviticus 26, this time at verse 18, God gives the opposite. He says this, and after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Now, we're not explaining that part of the verse. That's part of a longer sentence. But he goes on to say this. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. And finally, and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. So God says, listen, if you don't obey me, if you don't do what I say, if you ignore my word and you do whatever's right in your own eyes, I'm gonna stop the rain. And when I stop the rain, you're, not gonna, ha you're gonna be in famine. So when we read here in Ruth during the time of Judges that there was a famine and we know that during the time of, of Judges there was a fourfold cycle, remember it? Sin, suffering, supplication, salvation. The people sinned and the judgment of God came. And one form of that judgment was God turned off the spigot. And he said, if you're not gonna listen to me, you're not gonna have the land of milk and honey that I promised you. You're not gonna experience the life that I intended for you to experience. And while we haven't been promised a land, there's no, there's no land promised to the church. Uh, we have not been promised rain and crops and, and, and all of those things that were given to a, God's nation Israel. There is abundant life promised to the believer. But that abundant life is conditional, isn't it? It's conditional on the fact that A, we make a decision to receive Jesus Christ. B, we make a decision to turn from our sinful lifestyle. And C, we make a decision to abide and grow in Christ. And then the abundant life comes. So Israel couldn't raise their fist and say, God, you promised us milk and honey and we're in a famine. What they had to do is they had to raise their fist and say, God, we're sorry. We disobeyed you. We're not experiencing your promises because we're not doing what you want us to do. And so there was famine in the land as a result of the sin of the people. Now, it's interesting that if you lived at the time of Ruth, it would be only those who looked at life through the filter of the word of God that would recognize that the famine was a consequence of the immorality. I would wager to say, and not being there, I, I can't be dogmatic about this, but I would wager to say that the common thought among the people was that the famine was just a natural consequence. This is just what happens. Sometimes we have rainfall and sometimes we don't. Sometimes there's drought. Sometimes life's more difficult. And they would look at just natural, or natural events in order to explain their circumstances. But if you looked at the world through the filter of the word, you would realize that the famine was a result of the sin of the people. And things are no different today. 
You know, we, we look at, at the world today. And if you don't look at the world through the filter of the word, you're going to miss what it is that God wants out of us and God wants us to do. We live in a world filled with darkness, getting darker and darker, it seems, as the days go by. And when we look at it through the filter of God's word, we can see, like Ruth and Boaz will ultimately do, we can determine how we're supposed to live. So there was this famine in the land. Now, the result of the famine, we read also in verse 1, is that uh, Elimelech took his family and they went to the country of, what country is that? Moab. Now, Moab was a border country to Israel. If you're looking at a map, it was just across the Jordan River from, and, and then south. It, it, you know, right across the Jordan and then south down along the Dead Sea, that was Moab. And um, Moab, the Moabites, were descendants of Abraham, uh, Abraham's nephew Lot. And so there was a, some relationship between Israel and Moab. When Israel was sent from Egypt up to the promised land, they were instructed by God not to attack Moab or Ammon or any of these other nations. They were given a specific piece of real estate. They were never to become an empire conquering nation after nation and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They were given a specific chunk of real estate. Those nations nearby really were to be the uh, sort of the mission field for the nation of Israel. As they got themselves right, as they became the people that God wanted them to be, they would impact the nation. And really under David's reign, we see that, that happening to a large degree. Uh, Moab stood out uh, among some of these other nations because of their history with Israel. When the children of Israel were traveling through the wilderness, uh, the, the Moabites were afraid that they would be attacked. And so Balak, who was the king of Moab, hired a false prophet named Balaam. And Balaam uh, spoke to the Moabites and, and explained to them really how they would be able to best stop Israel. And so through the counsel of Balaam, the women of Moab seduced the men of Israel into idolatry and sexual immorality, and as a result, into the judgment of God. And so uh, they, they had a history of, of attacking Israel where it hurts. As a result of that, the Moabites sat under a kind of an interesting curse as it related to Israel. And if you note the screen, this is Deuteronomy 23. Uh, we read there, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord. And the next verse reads, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, that was the Ammonites, and because they hired against you Balaam the son of Baor from uh, Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. So there was this curse. So here we have in the start of this book of Ruth, again, it's a beautiful story of grace and redemption, but how does it start? It starts in a dark, dark world. And it starts with a man, Elimelech. And Elimelech seems to be a godly man. He seems to be a man that wants to walk with the Lord. But the circumstances of his world cause him to kind of drift from the Lord. He makes a decision to take his family out of Israel because of the difficulties, and he goes to Moab. And Moab was a particularly cursed place. <laughs> you can't really justify his actions. Can't really say, well, you know, he's, he's doing what God wants him to do. He's, he's making a decision based upon his circumstances that is going to take him away from the Lord. And there'll be consequences for those. We find that while he is uh, in Moab, three major events happen. Event number one is he dies. Okay, so Elimelech that went to Moab to find food found a grave. Secondly, his sons marry Moabite women. Okay, now, um, based upon what happens, I mean, it, it, one of them becomes a believer, if not both of them. But their, their decision to marry these Moabite women is definitely a compromise. And then the third thing that happens is that his two sons die. So here this man, he leaves his, his family. There's four of them when they head out. 
and three of the four die. And the return trip is his wife, Naomi, and one of their daughters-in-law. Now, picking up uh, in verse 6, it, this tells the story of uh, what transpires from here. Verse 6 says, Then she, this is after the death of her sons, she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return to the country or from the country of Moab. Listen to this. You might want to underline it. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Now that's a very important sentence. Here's why. What was the cause of the famine? Sin. What's the cycle in Judges? Sin, suffering, supplication. So what's happening here in verse 6, because this is taking place sometime during the, the, the time of the Judges, Sometime here in this period, the people have sinned, they're suffering, this has gone on for 10 years, and now the Lord is showing his favor again upon the people. Why? Because they turn back to the Lord. And what a beautiful picture. You know, it's God wants to, to, to bless his people. God wants to show favor. He wants to be good to us. And when we turn back to him, he'll pour out his favor upon us. And so uh, Naomi and Ruth and Orpha is the other uh, daughter-in-law. And they begin, not to be confused with Oprah, um, they uh, make this journey back towards Jerusalem. Verse 7 says uh, they, that she went out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law. They went on the way towards Judah and Noa Noemi. Naomi said to the daughters-in-law, go return to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest each, each of you in the house of his husband. And she kissed them and tried to encourage them to leave. And basically what's happening is she's looking, she's saying, listen, I'm a, I'm a widow. I'm too old for anyone else to want to marry. Um, you, you know, you were married to my sons-in-law. They're, they're dead. So chances are somebody wanting to marry you is, is probably pretty slim in Israel, you are a Moabite under the curse, so you probably should just go back home. Go back to Moab, find a good man, get married, enjoy life, and I'll just go back on my own. And uh, this is where enters the most well-known passage in the book of Ruth, this, this beautiful exchange. Uh, we'll pick up there in verse 14. It says, they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And Ruth said, or I'm sorry, she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. So Oprah takes off, and Naomi's sister, Ruth, you go too. And here's Ruth's exchange. Ruth says, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For, ever, for wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go, she stopped speaking to her. And so here we find this beautiful picture here as Ruth makes a decision to cling to, Noah, to uh, Naomi and to cling to, Na to Naomi's God. She converts, she's, this is a full-fledged commitment to Jehovah God. In doing so, she is leaving behind the, the, the ancestral worship that she'd grown up with. She's leaving behind the lifestyle that she'd grown up with. She's leaving behind all of the influences that are saying, listen, you need to be a true Moabitess. And she's making a decision to follow the Lord. And she commits herself completely to the Lord. It's a beautiful picture of conversion. And I think that there are some interesting uh, components involved in why she makes this decision. Notice what she says there. She says, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. In other words, Ruth, looking at Naomi, realized that Naomi lived differently than the Moabites lived. 
There was something different. Your people and you. There, there's something different about you. <laughs> you. You don't behave the way we behave. You're, you're, the, the way you think, the way you act, the way you behave is different. And then your God will be my God. And that is that your different behavior is a direct byproduct of you having a different God. You're living for something that we're not living for. And so it was, it was Naomi, even in that state of leaving Israel and going to Moab where she shouldn't have gone, still she's a light to the world. Still she's living above the culture and having an impact upon a woman for the kingdom of God and a very important woman for the kingdom of God. Now, um, if you note the screen, Matthew chapter five, I think speaks to us regarding the same idea. Matthew five, Jesus said this. He said that you, he's speaking to us as followers, he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how will it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. In, in other words, listen, you're different from the world and you have, a, you have an, a preserving effect upon the world. You're to stand out in the world. Don't lose your savor. Don't, don't lose that ability of being different from the world and having an impact upon the world. He goes on and gives a second idiom. He says, you are the light of the world. That's who you are. You're a believer. You, you've been sent into the world to be a beacon of light in the midst of darkness to say, hey, listen, I'm a different person because I follow a different God. He says, you're that light. And then he says this, a city that's set on a hill can't be hidden. A, a city on a hill, you can't hide that. You, you know, the lights come on and everyone goes, oh, there's a city up there. Okay? It's a beautiful city. I like that Jesus used light and sort of nighttime to illustrate that because even the ugliest cities look beautiful at night. You know, when you're flying in, totally ugly city, but you're flying in at night, it just looks beautiful. All the lights, oh, how neat. And then you wake up in the morning, help. <laughs> a city set on a hill, you can't hide it. He goes on to say this in the next verse. He says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand that it may give light to those who are in the house. In other words, listen, you are the light of the world. You can't hide that. If you're a Christian, you can't hide it. People are going to notice. People are going to see it. You've got a different God. You've got different behaviors. And then he says this, so don't try. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to hide the fact that you're committed to Jesus Christ. Man, let that out. In fact, the next verse, he'll say that. Let it out. Let your light shine before men. And here's the result, that they'll see your good works. Your people are my people. They'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, your God, is my God. And so Ruth, that beautiful picture of a conversion taking place. And as the chapter then ends, uh, Naomi and Ruth make their way into Bethlehem. Verse 19 puts it like this. Uh, the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited. And they said, is this Naomi? They were all so happy. Years ago she so happy she's coming back. You know, all her friends excited to see her um, and just celebrating her return. In verse 20 says this, she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Now the word Naomi is, it means pleasantness, okay? Pleasantness. So in their language, it, don't call me pleasant. Instead, she says, call me Mara. And the word Mara means bitter. So don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. And she says, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, the Lord brought me back again empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? Notice two things that are happening here. One is that her circumstances are causing her to, uh, uh, to have a skewed view of God. Um, she, she's gone through some difficulty, I mean, She's faced three of the most difficult things you'll ever face in life, right? Her husband died, her son died, and then her other son dies. That's hard. Added to that is now because they're dead, she is really, she's a widow, and she's really destined to probably a life of poverty. She's going to have a rough go for the rest of her life. Now, those difficult circumstances skew her view of God. 
and she begins to blame God for her circumstances. Now, sin was the cause of the suffering, remember? And compromise was the cause of leaving Bethlehem and going to Moab. And yet, there's a blame thrown on God. And, and, and we're good at that. You know, she, Naomi's not alone in that. We're, we're really good. We make a decision. And then when we, w when we have to live with the consequences of that decision, we blame God. We say, God, how could you let this happen? He's saying, listen, I warned you. I gave you my word that warned you. I brought people in your life that warned you. And you didn't want to listen to me. And then you ended up suffering. And now you're blaming me. God, you're, if you're a miracle working God, why can't you fix this? I've been praying for you to fix it. It's like, yeah, but listen, you can't blame me for that. She, she has a skewed perspective of God because her circumstances are difficult. Now, the, that skewed perspective of God then develops within her a bitterness. And that bitterness is a very, very poisonous root. That's, that's something that will radically uh, affect you and the people that are around you. And here, you know, I mean, just think about it. Just think of the effect of bitterness right away. She walks up and there's all these women. They're so happy to see her. They're like, oh my gosh, we're so happy. You're back. I can't believe it. We, we've, been, we've missed you. We've heard stories, no doubt, of, 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 of the difficulties that she's faced. And welcome, come back. You know, we want to help you. And yet, right away, her bitterness, she looks at him and she says, don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. God made me this way. You know, just what a poison that is. But listen. As the story continues, here's what's going to happen. The bitterness of Naomi is going to be undone by the grace of God. In fact, you can look it up on your own. Though she says, call me Mara, there's not one time in the book of Ruth that anybody calls her Mara. <laughs> the, the author refuses to call her Mara. He calls her Naomi every single time. Pleasant, 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 pleasant. And at the end of the book, She's pleasant. At the end of the book, the grace of God is won out. In the second chapter, we're introduced to the, the second main character of the book. Uh, his name is Boaz. We read, there was a relative of Naomi's husband, uh, a man of great wealth. He was of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And uh, Ruth, so we're introduced to him, and then they'll be introduced to him. Ruth, uh, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field of the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Um, we, we see here that as they arrive there, they get a place to stay. We're not told where that is. And then they have to find a way to provide for themselves. And uh, Ruth is going to head out and she's going to glean grain um, at, uh, in, in hopes that she can find favor, is what she says. Now, the idea of gleaning grain, it was the Old Testament way of helping out the poor. This was their means of, of ministering to those who, who didn't have. And uh, Leviticus 23 gives the details of this law. If you notice the screen, this is written to the landowner. And it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, uh, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor of the land and the stranger, I'm the Lord. So both, both of these women fit into that category. The poor of the land is Naomi and the stranger is Ruth the Moabitess. And so there's this law. Listen, hey, you're gonna go out and glean your field? Go for it. But the corners, the edges, don't glean them. You leave that for the poor. They can come and they can, they can have their own. Also, when, when they went through, they didn't go through twice. They went through once and whatever they didn't get the first time was left for the poor to come through and they could live off that. It was, the, it was their, sort of their, their, their welfare. It was one that required work out of the individual if they wanted to get anything to eat. And they went and worked and they brought in their own food. But it was provided by the, the landowners. And so here is... Boaz, he has this field, and he is obeying the word of God. He's doing what Leviticus 23, 22 tells him to do. 
He's gleaning his land, he's leaving the edges, and he's allowing the poor of, of Bethlehem to come and to glean in the field. And so Ruth goes to Boaz field in order to glean for her and Naomi. Okay, so that's how the sort of the, uh, the story's unfolding. It's while she is obeying the word of God that Naomi will find the favor of God. Okay, and I think that that's critical. She said, I'm going to glean and I'm looking for favor. And she goes to glean because that's what Leviticus told her to do. Hey, you don't have anything? Don't sit around and do nothing. Put your hand out. Get to work in the field. That's what the word of God's telling you in your condition, Ruth. So she goes and does it. And in that state, she finds favor with God. And there she meets this guy, Boaz. Now, um, verse 3 said this. Halfway through it says, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz who was the f of the family of Elimelech. Now, would she know that? When she saw Boaz, would she go, oh, that's Elimelech's brother or his cousin or his nephew or his uncle? Like, we don't know particularly you know, what relation they were. She wouldn't know that. She just went to the field. It was like, well, there's a field. She walks onto the field. She starts working. And she happened, you might want to underline that word, she happened unto the field of Boaz. Well, how did that happen? <laughs> how did she happen unto that field? She happened unto that field because she was doing what God wanted her to do, seeking the favor of God, and God led her exactly where he wanted her. And you know, if we want to be led of the Lord, we want God's leading in our life, it starts with obeying his word. If you want to end up where God wants you, what do you do? Well, you look at your circumstances in light of God's word and you do what God's word says. And that will lead you to who God wants you to be, what you're supposed to be. And so Naomi follows that. The same thing true of Boaz. Boaz is just doing what the Lord wants him to do. And as he's doing what the Lord wants him to do, he's gonna find the love of his life. Okay, it's, this deal works out really well for Boaz. Okay, so they go... Um, now, uh, chapter two just talks about her gleaning and he sees her and right away he's struck. Like, he sees her and he, he says to his servants, he says, who's, who's that? And they say, oh, that's that Moabite woman that came back with, with Naomi. He says, how's she been working? She's been working really hard, really. Well, here's what I want you to do. Drop extra. <laughs> like, spill your bags. Like, make sure she gets a lot. Take care of her. Keep an eye on her. So she comes home. And at the end of chapter two, Ruth says this to Naomi. You know, she comes in with a, she, she, by the way, they fed her lunch and she kept half of her lunch to bring home to her mother-in-law, which was nice. My mother-in-law is usually sending lunch home with me. Um, and uh, we're told in verse 19 that her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law uh, where she worked and said, the man's name with whom I worked was Boaz. And Naomi said to the daughter, blessed be the Lord who is not forsaken his kindness to the living and to the dead. Hey, that's bitter talking. See what the grace of God does? Bitter starts talking blessing. God's doing a work in her life and she, she, sells, she sees the hand of God in this. Now, what she'll tell him or what she'll tell Ruth is, is listen, now from here on out, don't go to anybody else's field. You just keep going back to that field, okay? And don't go hanging out with the other women and stuff. You just go there, get to work, and uh, I think his eye's on you. Now, chapter three is kind of an interesting chapter because um, because of it, it, this, this wouldn't fit really well in our culture. Okay, I'll read it to you. Naomi her mother-in-law said to her, my daughter, shall I seek security for you that it may be well with you? Um, this, by the way, this is a long time. That the, this has gone through two harvests. So months have passed. She's established this relationship. They know who Boaz is. Boaz knows who they are. And uh, so then uh, Naomi says, listen, do you want me to seek security? In other words, do you want to pursue this relationship? Are you hoping that Boaz will want to wed you? And so, uh, verse two, now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight in the threshing floor. Um, so the, the, all the harvesting is done, now they're processing it. 
Therefore, wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do, which every mother-in-law likes to hear. <laughs> so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went and lay down at the, at the heap of grain and she came softly, uncovered his feet and lay down. So he goes and lays down in the barn. Okay, he's tired, he's been working hard. He doesn't go back to his house. He lays down in the barn, he goes to sleep. And she sneaks in, she lays at his feet, okay? And um, uh, it says, it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself and there was a woman lying at his feet. Now that would startle me, okay? <laughs> that, would, that might alarm you a bit. And he said, who are you? And it's dark. Who in the world are you? What are you doing? <laughs> and she answered, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing for I am your close relative. The, in, what she's saying here is, listen, um, the, the, the law, in fact, we'll, we'll bring it up on the screen, Deuteronomy 25, the law stated this. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. His uh, husband, or, sorry, her husband's brother shall go in and take her as wife and perform the duty as husband, uh, as the husband's brother to her. Okay, so in order to keep the family line, the, the genealogy really, really important in Israel because ultimately the Messiah is coming. So he, the, here's the rule. Listen, so th they come, uh, she comes and says, listen, Boaz, you're my near kinsman. You, my, my husband, he died and we have no children. And so the word of God says, you can take that role of husband. If you're willing to do that, she's saying, I'm willing to allow you to do that. And so it's kind of an unorthodox thing. This is, this is definitely not a practice that a single woman should do today, okay? Don't get an idea that's like, well, I like that guy, so what I'm gonna do is sneak in his room at night and lay in his bed, okay? Don't do that, okay? That's not a proper application of this passage of scripture, okay? That would be a bad application of this truth. At that time, in the barn, and there's, there was nothing sexual about this, okay? He wakes up going, whoa, who are you? She says, I, I want you to know that if you are willing, I want you to perform that right. I want you to redeem me. And uh, he says to her, verse 10, it's beautiful. He says, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning in that you did not go after younger men, whether poor or rich. He says, you like me? <laughs> And he's willing to do it. But verse 12 introduces us to the problem. Now it is true, he says, that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. And so here here's lies the dilemma. So, so he sends her away. He, he sends her early, early in the morning. He gives her a whole bunch of grain to make it look like she'd been working. And, uh, and he sends her off. You know, they want to avoid every appearance of evil. They don't want anything implied that hadn't happened. He sends her off. And now he's got to figure, how am I going to get her? You see, she's really the property of another. There's a, there's a closer relative to Ruth than Boaz was. So Boaz goes according to the custom of the time, chapter four. Now Boaz went to the gate and sat down there and behold the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. Samuel is kind in that he doesn't name this character. And so Boaz said, come aside friend, sit down. So he came and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and sat down. So they all sat. And he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold a piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one uh, to buy, there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I'll redeem it. So, Elimelech had land, but he sold that land when he left. Now, land in Israel was never sold forever. It could always return back to the family. So it was that time which it could turn back to the family. And so Boaz says to this unnamed guy, he says, listen, you're next, you're in front of me in line here. You're the one that can, that can purchase back the land that is Naomi's. And, and you can have that as part of your inheritance. And he says, great, happy to do it. 
Good. Now here's where, you know, Boaz had really thought this out because the next verse says this. Verse five, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the, of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, okay? When you get the land, you get a wife and she wants kids, okay? Verse six, and the close relative said, quote, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I ruin my own inheritance. Okay, now what exactly does he mean by that? Two possibilities. Possibility number one is, I'm not going home and telling my wife I just bought a second wife, okay? That's gonna mess things up in my house and I'm not doing that, okay? That's one possibility. Possibility number two is the Moabites were under a curse. And he's saying, I'm not ruining my inheritance by bringing a Moabite Gentile into my home. So one of those two things she's saying, I'm, I'm not, this is gonna ruin it, I'm not doing it. He says then, quote, you redeem my right of redemption for you yourself, for you yourself, for I cannot redeem it. And they go through this process that was, the, you know, our day, you know, you'd, you'd you know, sign a legal document and shake a hand. They took a shoe off, did something with a shoe. It's like, here's the shoe, you know, take my shoe. And, you know, there was like this shoe swap. And, and so, um, you know, whatever, that was the custom. Even, even Samuel, when he writes it, he says, well, that's what they used to do back then. Like, it was corny, but that's what they did. So, um, so they have this, this exchange, and Boaz agrees that he's going to purchase the field, and by purchasing the field, he's also going to gain Ruth as his wife, and Naomi, because of her relationship with Ruth, is going to be cared for under the care of Boaz. And so we read that... Uh, they made that deal and uh, the women who were told in verse 12 said, may the house, uh, may your house be like the house of Perez whom Tamar bore children to, the Lord give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception. She bore a son and the, and the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in all Israel and may you be a restorer of life and a nourisher uh, of your old age for, you, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, uh, who is better to you than seven sons um, has borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became the nurse to him. Uh, and then we're told, if, if you look down in verse 22, that this is the genealogy and ultimately Obed begot Jesse and Jesse begot David. So God restores and this, this fullness of grace is poured out and, and you know, bitter Mara doesn't exist, does she? She's this wonderfully sweet, excited grandma who's taking care of her grandchild and just totally loving because of the grace of God. Now, um, the last thing, and we'll tie us up with this, is, is We've been seeking to see Jesus in, in our text of scripture. And if you'll note the screen, this is our verse in John's gospel. We'll read it out loud together. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. And so we've seen that the Bible is about Jesus and he can be found on every page. And it's not hard to uncover similarities between uh, Ruth, and Naomi's condition and our condition, and Boaz and his work of redemption and the work of Christ. Uh, and we see that uh, Ruth sat under a curse and that there was something in the way of Boaz being able to redeem uh, Ruth, and yet Boaz goes beyond that which is in the way and purchases back Ruth for himself. Jesus used this phrase in uh, Matthew's gospel. It's on the screen. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Now, in the story that Jesus is depicting here, the, the, the person who... Uh, finds the hidden treasure in the field is God. The field is the world and the hidden treasure is us. And uh, it's interesting to me in light of the book of Ruth and Boaz, it's interesting that, it re that he reads that he found a field just as Boaz had a found a field and that he 
found a treasure in that field just as Boaz had found Ruth and he hid it. And that exchange between Boaz and the unnamed where he says, hey, there's this field and you can have this field. It's this awesome field. And he's like, yeah, I want it. Be a great business venture. Be great for our, you know, our, our whole uh, portfolio package as we're big, you know, builder, bigger and bigger fields. And he says, oh, and by the way, there's a woman, that hidden treasure. And to, to the unnamed, it wasn't valuable. But to Boaz, it was the reason to buy the field. And Jesus is saying that he did the same thing. Jesus is saying that he looked at the world and that he values this place because of the treasure and that you're the treasure. You're what matters to him. And that Jesus went to the cross to purchase, to purchase the world in order to save the treasure. In fact, jumping ahead to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, there's a scene in heaven where, where everyone's upset and they're upset because there's a scroll and no one can open the scroll and they're weeping. And then, and then suddenly there's this, this bellowing voice that says, behold, the lion of, tri of the tribe of Judah, that he's the one who can come, he can open the scroll. And that scroll, some consider to be the title deed of the earth, that the, the earth was given to man, but was forfeited to Satan, and Satan controlled it, and no one could get it back from him. But Jesus, Jesus bought the field in order to get the treasure. And so the book of Ruth is such a poetic picture of God's desire of redeeming man, but also a great illustration for us of how an individual making decisions to obey the word of God, to do what God wants, can have a lasting impact upon the world. Who knew when Ruth looked at Naomi and said, there's something different about you. Your God makes you different and I want that. Who knew that she would find herself in Matthew chapter one listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? God had a bigger picture. And when we obey the Lord, we don't necessarily get to see that worked out. She didn't, uh, Ruth didn't live long enough to see David. David, David was over 100 years after the story of Ruth is over. But she played a critical role in that.